morning, everybody. It's good to see you today. Thanks for coming out. Uh, we caught a little uh, window in El Nino here and have a few hours of sunshine, so we're having the service at exactly the right time. We thought uh, we were almost rained out here because of the backup in the sewer system due to the huge rains last night, but the wonderful crew here at the Media Center got out all this equipment in the night and stood in ankle-deep water, and they cleaned it all up for us because they knew we were coming this morning. So the, the folks who manage this place are just they're so great. Well, welcome to week four here at the Media Center. This is our new home. So when you look around, you'd have to say, well, not bad for a month. <laughs> we're, we're doing okay. We do want to fill up all of these chairs. That's why that we have them. We have the invitation cards for you that uh, we just uh, just love being here in the Arts District and being in the middle of downtown. Is, uh, it's, it's just a great place. You know, when you walk down the street here uh, during business hours, you feel the power and the energy of a city. Uh, Berkeley is like a roiling cauldron of economic activity. Not just the construction, but the investment and the businesses. There are 17,000 enterprises here in just 10 square miles. I mean, it's just, it's just this huge outpouring uh, of, there's unimaginable wealth here in Berkeley and in the Bay Area uh, for some people. Uh, the class distinctions are, 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 are pretty harsh. Uh, money uh, pours out, but so does uh, poverty and uh, crime and disease and violence and all the other kind of urban stuff. It's all mashed up kind of together here. Uh, and we can make all the same claims about another city, uh, Jerusalem, in the first century, when Jesus visited it in the last uh, few hours of his life. In the midst of a city that was in terrible pain under Roman occupation, where state violence is a way of life, and he is moments perhaps for being arrested, he comes up with a plan, let's wash everybody's feet. City's crying out, people are dying, the sick are still sick, the dead are still dead, and Jesus says there are 24 feet, and I intend to wash them all. I'm reading this passage this week, and I'm thinking, I bet this is how churches look to the city from the outside. Here we are with all of these uh, urban problems, we call them, and uh, it seems like Christian congregations have this answer. We will have potluck dinners, and we will sing songs looking at a wall, and that is going to somehow magically fix everything and uh, make all of those urban problems some, somehow better. Uh, and Jesus then becomes to look like well, in a really tough area, he looks sort of like Tylenol. He treats symptoms at best, but he can't really cure anything. And in a flourishing urban area, say this neighborhood, he looks about as necessary as AOL. You remember AOL? You don't need it at all. And, and it, depending on your context, he can come across either of those ways. So the question we've been looking at in this last series of talks is, what exactly is it that Jesus brings to the city? Whether it's in a tough place or whether it's in a good place, what does it mean? What did he speak to urban areas? And the first talk we said he brings tears. His compassion for people who hurt in cities. And last week we talked about the whip he brought to the temple, confronting systemic injustice and unrighteousness that cities tend to be the host for. Uh, today it's uh, Jesus after dark in Jerusalem. Passover is at hand. His followers have rented an upper room where they're going to have their last Passover meal together. And uh, he is going to make the radical choice to wash those 24 feet. Now, John's account of Jesus' life describes him in this season, a lot of John, chapters 13 through 17, as preparing the disciples for his departure. It's just about for them to be a world minus Jesus. The band is breaking up. And so the thing he talks about the most with them is love. He mentions it 31 times in these last few chapters versus just six times in the first 12 chapters of the book. Now, those numerical counts aren't the be-all and end-all of anything, but they do kind of indicate that it's a real big emphasis for him. And as they meet for this last Passover meal, John skips the account of the Lord's Supper, what we call communion today, and he goes right to this event. I'm just going to read these for you, just kind of open your heart, your ears, and just kind of soak this in for a minute. This is John chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own, 
who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, some scholars think that verse 1 here should stand separately, that it's the introduction to the entire second half of John. And it focuses on the fact that he loved his disciples to the end. It would better translate it this way. He loved his disciples completely. In other words, he fulfilled everything that is love for another person. In the sense that his love was not just an emotion, but it took the sacrificial action of dying on the cross for them, as Isaiah predicts that he would pour out his life unto death. So Jesus brings complete love to the city. He brings love without loopholes. He brings a kind of love that doesn't exclude certain groups because they don't look like me. He brings a sort of love that doesn't bring judgment down on people who need mercy. He brings a kind of love that does not have footnotes, codicils, asterisks, conditions. It's not a contract. It's just a statement. I love you and I'm going to love you completely. I'm going to love you so completely that the kind of love I have is going to take the form of sacrificial action, which is going to put your life in a whole different place in your relationship with God. You're not going to find any exceptions. You're not going to find anyone left out, anyone put down, anyone spat upon, because this love is holistic, it's fully developed, it's mature, and it has no lack. Religion asks us to earn God's approval The Apostle Paul wrote, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So here's the first thing I want to say to you today. Servants have complete love. People who serve have a complete kind of love. Now this is not an easy task when the 24 feet you're intending to wash are attached to these 12 men. (laughs) They are not in a good place, as we say today. Uh, Let's just leave aside the fact that two of the feet belong to Judas, who is just about to turn him over to the Roman and temple authorities to be arrested, tortured, beaten, tried, and murdered. Uh, The other 11 guys are not so hot either. The other gospel writers record that while Jesus is involved in this just phenomenally lovely act of service, what a lot of biblical scholars call a living parable, this breathtaking moment where the Son of God is going to humble himself and take on a job that he's going to become the help. He's he's going to act like a slave. In the background, the 11 are arguing about who's the greatest. Have you ever noticed that in the city, there's a lot of thought given to who's the coolest guy in the room? You know, you've been to, uh, here's here's how we see this a lot, is we go to, uh, Mm -hmm. I'll just say we go to functions a lot here in the city. And when we do, uh, it's like, chickens in a barnyard. Everybody's battling to establish pecking order. Like, you'll say something and the person next to you tries to say something to top that, to be smarter, to be funnier. It's it's sort of a, well, everybody acts like they're four. It's a shoving match back and forth. You know, me, 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 me. Well, these uh, 11 men, 12, are acting like they've never met Jesus of Nazareth. They don't even know who he is. They just showed up for this dinner and all of a sudden, they're in the middle of this uh, an, an enormous argument that very parallels kind of the attitude uh, that can permeate uh, city life. Often when we're in coffee houses, which is where we tend to office, uh, we hear people on cell phones uh, talking loudly. And uh, they are attempting to sound important on their phone calls. Have you ever heard this? Yeah. Yes, Bob, I think the uh, deal in Shanghai should precede the deal in Singapore. I'll have those numbers to you by uh, close of business today. Close of business Berlin time, by the way. Mm-hmm. We heard that conversation <laughs> last week at a coffee house that will remain nameless. And it's, oh, that guy's unemployed. <laughs> it's a total bluff. The other way we know the unemployed person is their business card has too many words on it. 
Uh, I'm the uh, astronomical economical consultant to international business multinational corporate infrastructure. That means you're on Monster.com eight hours a day looking for a job. You don't really know what you do. You don't have an office. Your cat sits in your lap all day while you search looking for some kind of position. But it's just so important to be somebody here. And not just that, but you be better. That's right. No one came here to be second. No, no one came here to be a, a mentee, but a mentor. No one came here to be a follower. It's about being a leader. That's why we're here, because this urban area is a platform for that kind of success. You may not fight your way to the top of the heap. You may not have a plan for global domination, but you can fight your way to the top end of the middle. <laughs> That's still pretty good. And it gives people a kind of an attitude, which is this four-year-old shoving back and forth, not you, me, 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 me. And and that's just what his followers are doing. Three years of watching him raise the dead and heal the sick and teach things no one had ever heard before in their show. Isn't this the part where Jesus should show up with that whip? These guys are being so bad. Shouldn't this be where he takes the cords together and he brings down fire and lightning and power of God and just blows them out of the water he should bring a whip but whenever it seems like whip time he brings the towel instead religion says whip them and Jesus says teach them I will show you a better way I am among you he said in Luke 22 as one who serves so here's what happens he takes his outer garment, removes it, and he lays it aside. The verb translated there as lays it aside is the same one used in John chapter 10 when he's describing his own laying down of his life. The next time Jesus takes off that outer garment, it won't be him doing it. It will be Roman soldiers ripping it off his back so they can whip him and scourge him as part of the torture inflicted on him during his trials. The second thing I want to say to you today that serving means laying something aside. Now, I can't really serve other people if my hands are full of kind of my own stuff, even good stuff. At some point, I'm going to lay something aside. Maybe my smartphone. Maybe my video games. Maybe my daily fantasy sports betting on my smartphone while I'm playing my video games. Maybe whatever. It doesn't really matter. But if, if, if we're going to walk in this example and really serve, I'm going to have, something is going to have to fall out of my hands. It's a zero-sum game. I can't have it all. Something's going to have to be released. Something's going to have to be laid aside. Now Jesus knows who he is. He makes that clear later in this passage but he volunteers to act like a slave caring for the twelve by washing their feet. Philippians 2 describes this as him emptying himself and taking on the form of a servant. Now the form is just a slave's apron. He's, he's got it tied around in a kind of a towel like thing. It's a basin of water and 24 uh, dirty feet including Jesus. This towel is the emblem of the fact that you're in this position of servitude. But holding you a holding a towel doesn't make me a servant any more than having a smartphone makes me smart. People sometimes say, well, I, 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 uh, I, I'm, in, I'm involved in, in serving. I went and tutored a child this week for an hour, which is a good thing, which is great, which we recommend. But it's also something the kind of thing that's required of, every, of lots of people who are convicted of crime in court and who are sentenced to community service. It's the same kind of action. Really serving, really uh, taking on the identity of a servant it is a condition of the heart. It's a completeness of the love that God puts inside us for other people that wells up inside us and, and results in this sort of sacrificial action that expresses itself in my whole life, not just in a an hour working a shift at a food bank, which is also a good thing. Otherwise, it's just resume building. Like the undergraduate students I've met who have been heavily involved in local nonprofits until the day that they make it into grad school. 
<laughs> they, we, we have had this experience personally, and then they drop all their commitments because they've convinced the admissions committee that they're they're in, involved in their community, which they are, but only as a mechanism for getting into graduate school, which is not really the same as completeness of love. I could pay somebody to do that. I could force somebody to do that. Everybody in town is wearing an ankle bracelet is probably involved in something like that in a court ordered way. Now, foot washing in ancient Palestine is pretty much an essential thing. The uh, streets and the sewers are the same thing. Basically, the Romans improved that a little bit, but not so much. So if you showed up at my house and you had walked there, unlike Berkeley, they did not wear socks with their sandals. They just came in out of the dust with the sandals. And uh, washing had a, probably a little bit of public health benefit, maybe not so much. It was really all about hospitality, which is sacred to the point of almost being religious in this culture. So if you show up at my house, you've come in out of these dusty streets, and the first thing I will do is either have my servant attached to you for the washing of your feet. It's just going to make you much more comfortable, feel like you're much more at home, and if I can be blunt, we will all stink much less if there's rampant foot washing when we get together in a group. Or if the servant's not available, I'll just give you a towel and a basin, and lots of time people just wash their own. But you had to at least make those basic elements uh, available to them. Not to offer foot washing is a social breach of etiquette that it's very difficult for us to understand today because hospitality does not mean very much or not mean nearly as much as it does in these times. It would be something like, I, I thought about this all week, this is the only parallel I can come up with. It would be something like a visitor coming to your house and you refusing to give them the password for your Wi-Fi. Sorry, Bob, don't really trust you. You know, I know you've got that uh, fantasy sports betting problem, and uh, I think I'm going to give you a little help here, show you a little love, and uh, the Wi-Fi password, uh, it's just not going to happen. Well, Bob's going to get up and storm out. This is exactly what would happen with no foot washing. And, and it, it, this is a, uh, it's a, it's a lovely custom that is a way of saying, you, we are so glad you're here we will get the stink off of you so you can be here in a more comfortable atmosphere because we're probably meeting for a meal. It's just, it's, we have, there is no parallel to it today. It's just, it's, it's fantastic and it's a beautiful image of what servanthood is about that everybody's going to like. Not so. John goes on with his story in chapter 13. He gives us Peter's response to this. He, meaning Jesus, came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am about, what I am going, doing, you do not understand, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him. That is why he said, Not all of you are clean. Peter pushes back. He fights this. This is, this is not right. Why would you wash my feet. In the original language, you and my are both very emphatic. It's almost like he's, he's shouting them back at Jesus. This, this, this just should not be happening. This is uh, so out of line with what we approve of in, in our culture. This is completely the wrong timing for this. You're telling us you're leaving, and just when we need to hear from you in an authoritative way, you're putting on the garments of a slave and getting down on your knees in front of us, there's just that can't possibly be the way to go. In fact, this job was considered so terrible that uh, only non Jewish slaves were allowed to participate in it, even in Jewish households. And this story in John is so rare that it is the only example of a superior person washing an inferior person's feet in all of the literature we have from the Greco-Roman world. It's nowhere else. It's an amazing, it, it's, it's shocking 
to these people who are living in this particular context. And so Peter is saying the third thing that I'd like to tell you this morning that being a servant is countercultural. Resume building is cool. Doing the shift at the food bank is cool. Uh, if you have to wear the ankle bracelet, you, you, you've got to do it. But to really serve people in, in an environment like an urban area that is extremely competitive, some people are going to say that's wrong, that you're being a fool, that you're wasting your life, that you're throwing it away because it just swims upstream so radically. Jesus is providing this beautiful lived parable, parable and Peter's just on, he just can't see it. Sometimes your culture gets in the way so much that you just, you know, God will just put something right in front of me and my baby boomer, white guy blinders will just block me. I just can't see it. It's like I have this big brick in front of my eyes and to other people it's so you know, so obvious that it just is not to me. City folks can be pretty tuned into status, and so lowering yourself to step back to be a little less is like betraying the social contract. Wait a minute. I thought this was the up escalator. I didn't come here to use the stairs. You know, if you start doing that, like the whole system is being threatened here. You know, we're, we're, this is a free market of uh, success and achievement. And if you spend your time with that kid instead of working on your next promotion, that you're undercutting the whole, I mean, everything's at risk. If people started thinking that way, what would, you know, what would, what would happen to us? And the Lord just tells them, look, it's an all or nothing deal. It's complete love. I can wash you. And every now and then you'll probably need a little tune-up on the feet. But I'm going to wash you completely. I'm going to wash your sins. I'm going to wash that old life. I'm going to wash all that junk you've been dragging around. All, the, all those arrows life has shot into you. I can just, those wounds. I'm just, I'm just going to wash you. Complete love puts its arms around you and it just it just washes everything. Peter feels the love in that. He feels the completeness of it. And he says, Yeah, yeah, just do it all. Do it all. I'm not gonna hold anything back. You can wash my head, you can wash my hands, you can spray me down with a fire hose if you want to. Just let's get it done. Let's just get it done. Jesus wraps it up with these words in John 13, beginning verse 12. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for so I am. But if then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that also you should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is the messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Do you understand what I have done for you? The fourth thing here that really speaks to me is... Uh, Servants are happier. <laughs> they just are. <laughs> when he says you're going to be blessed if you do this, blessed means happy. That, that, that this isn't a grim death march into the future. Of people who give themselves away out of completeness of love, and there's great social science evidence for this. I'll spare you all the details, but it's really pretty conclusive that they're, they're happier, they're more psychologically well-adjusted, and they live longer than people that don't give themselves away. This is not a, a path to drudgery. It's a path to fulfillment, to completion. Sure, it's countercultural. Sure, there's resistance to it. But it's, it's a way of expressing the completeness of the love that only Christ is able to put into our hearts in, in sacrificial action that helps other people. And the satisfaction and the joy that comes from that is what gives the meaning to everything else, not the other way around.
This passage is like a mirror to me, and here's the challenge it's given me. It's asked me this question. How complete is my love? This week I was uh, walking my dog, which I, I do every morning, which he deeply cherishes. <coughs> we meet a neighbor we have known for five or six years, and she tells us that uh, her brother is in jail. Not a major thing, but a thing, enough to put you in for a little while. And uh, tells me the, the story, this is a, a brother we, we've known for, for quite a while as well. And I'm listening to all of this, and in my uh, mind, I am hearing the words of the gospel, Jesus' words, I was in prison, and you visited me. And uh, my immediate reaction was to <coughs> jump into the Peter role. Oh, man. <laughs> I don't want to do that. <laughs> it's so far away, and I don't even know if I can get in. There'll be a million complications. I'm not afraid to do it. I've been in jails a million times, penitentiaries, murderers, everything. But it's just, it was, I realized, geez, you're, it's, you're not afraid to be uh, in jail with criminals. You're afraid of the inconvenience. <sighs> And I realized my love has a hole in it about this big. And it made me start to wonder, where are the other holes? Are there voids in there that are opportunities where I could just not necessarily take a trip to visit someone, but just be kinder, just you know, help someone clean up a latte that spills on their keyboard instead of laughing at them and walking away. Uh, you know, just reach out to someone, hold the door, just little stuff, even micro stuff. There's so many, when I, you, you get into this treadmill of achievement and all the stuff that our urban area represents, and you just forget about all the tiny little ways that we could civilize this place. But what Jesus is offering the city is a faith community whose love can be complete, who can serve in ways big and small, and make life humane in the urban world. Lord, we're grateful for this gift that you've given us. We thank you for your love that's alive in our hearts and thank you for uh, the great hope that we have for our cities that uh, that kind of love can spill over into us really taking care of each other, being better to each other, uh, especially in the, the small ways that add up to something big. Lord, we ask you in your strong name that you would... Uh, we're here today with wounds. We're here today with, with uh, shortcomings and sins. I mean, we all are here in that, that way. God, if we're here with hurts, with disappointments, we ask you in this time of worship that there would just be a washing. It would just be a washing. Lord, just do our head and our hands too. Don't hold anything back. But touch us in a deep way, we pray. We thank you and we pray I ask you to stand with us, if you would, please. And uh, our band's going to lead us in a little bit more worship. And uh, this morning, if it be helpful for you to have someone just pray with you before you left today, uh, Jan and I will be in the back there, and we'll pray with you in a discreet way that will make you glad that, that you came. Sometimes that's a that can be an important thing. So, uh, at the, And then we will uh, come to the end of our time together.